Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the LSE. It's nice to see so many people here on um, a warm evening when the temptation of sitting in Lincoln's Inn Fields with a bottle of cold Sauvignon Blanc must be, well, it would be irresistible to me if I hadn't agreed to do this first. So, uh, but anyway, uh, obviously there are more earnest seekers after truth uh, around uh, than I suspected. I'm delighted to have Stephen Green here this evening, um, and obviously uh, the prime purpose is to talk about uh, his book, uh, Good Value. Uh, I jumped on this because I assumed that it was about accounting standards, um, <laughs> but uh, very disappointing uh, to me to find that it wasn't actually a resolution of the fair value mark-to-market debate, but uh, anyway, we'll come on to what it, what it is. Um, Stephen uh, is uh, 60, one foot in the grave. Uh, Free bus pass. <laughs> yeah, bus pass. That's so no doubt he's going home on his freedom pass this evening. Um, was at Oxford first, at Exeter College, then went to the ODA, as it then was, or DFID, as it now is, uh, then to MIT and to McKinsey, uh, where, in fact, we were quite briefly overlapped, uh, only by a period of uh, about a year, I think. And then in 82, he joined HSBC um, and has been in captivity in HSBC uh, ever since, where uh, he did a variety of jobs earlier in his career and then became head of investment banking in 98, uh, chief executive in 2003, and then in an outrageous disregard of the corporate governance combined code, became chairman um, in 2006, a wholly non-compliant move. Um, but also uh, is a minister in the Church of England and you know, for those like me who know the Church of England, I should say he's also a Christian. That's not necessarily the case, I think, in the Church of England. But, um, and in fact, if you, if you Google uh, Stephen, you find a lot of very earnest evangelical stuff uh, attributed to Stephen Green. But it turns out that there's a second Stephen Green um, uh, who uh, speaks for something called Christian Voice. Um, and so you could easy to get confused uh, between the two. But... Uh, Stephen wrote an earlier book a few years ago called Serving God, uh, Serving Mammon, and now uh, his second significant tome is Good Value Reflections on Money, Morality, and an Uncertain World, which is, you might think, in present circumstances, rather tricky territory for a banker with all of the debates swirling around the financial sector about how it rewards itself and the damage that the financial sector has done uh, to the uh, economy, at least that's one narrative uh, that many people have developed. So you may think that this is uh, really um, sticking out your chin uh, to reflect from a position of chairman of one of the world's biggest banks uh, on money, morality and uncertain world. So why do you do that? Um, why did I write it? Um, yes. Or, uh, this is another question: How did I manage to write it? <laughs> um, the uh, I think um, since you mentioned it, I did write one some twelve years ago. It's out of print. It's out of date, um, and it's and it was a rather explicitly religious book that sought to explore the question of whether it's a reasonable thing to do to have the particular faith commitment that I have and be in the markets. Could you have a sense of being called to be a banker? Um, and various people at various points of time said, well, why don't you update that? Why don't you revise it? Would you now say the same thing? Uh, and, um, and I've always said I don't have time to do that, um, but I wouldn't change the basic thesis. Um, but then gradually, um, uh, one or two voices said, no, you really, you really should think about uh, putting your thoughts to paper. I said, I really can't do that. Uh, and then along came a friend of mine, Richard Addis, who's somewhere in this room, uh, who's a journalist, um, and uh, we found a way of working together which would enable me to get this done uh, with a lot of help from him. I, I have to say publicly without him I couldn't have got it done. Um, and, uh, and it became in the process a wider thing than the, than the previous one because it became a reflection on uh, globalization in fact. I mean that's, it's a cliche but in fact the big change that's taking over all of our lives at the moment in so many different ways is precisely that. Uh, it is changing uh, the whole of human experience, it's changing human consciousness itself. 
uh, it's a many-sided thing. It's a cultural thing. It's a commercial thing. Uh, it's about urbanisation. It's a very complex change, but it is the most important fact about the 21st century. And so, I mean, in this book, I should say for those who uh, haven't uh, read it, and I imagine that's most of you since it only comes out uh, well, today, today um, <laughs> uh, that it is a, it is a, a mixture in that, in that there's quite a lot of uh, reflections on the relevance of uh, faith to working in the markets and particularly uh, Taillard de Chardin and others. There's also, reflecting Stephen's first interest in German literature, uh, quite a bit about Goethe and Faust and the Mephistophelian bargain, um, uh, which is rather interesting. And um, in fact, in the FT, it revealed that he was currently reading a 1,000-page German novel in his spare time. And I can say this is true, uh, because Stephen and I were opposite each other on a plane back from China two weeks ago, and that is exactly what he was reading. So um, uh, I can prove that. Um, but. Also, uh, as he says, there's quite a lot about uh, the globalization uh, dimension of uh, business, um, but which interestingly sort of merges into uh, a discussion about um, values and the extent to which those are shared. So, so maybe I can sort of lead you into, into that and starting with the, the globalization uh, area. You say, and you're obviously as HSBC chairman, very well placed to talk about China, and you say that you think that there was a kind of unipolar world post from 89 kind of to about now, if you like, with the US, but that now we were in a bipolar world. Well, we're moving into one anyway. No, I didn't say bipolar, I said multipolar. Multipolar. Well, but my question really is, is that, I mean, is that really so in the sense that obviously in economic terms, if you look at GDP and the way it's shifting, yeah, fine. But in terms of project, the ability to project power, which the United States has uniquely, are you really saying that that's what the Chinese are planning to do? That the Chinese are planning to be a part of a multipolar world with the ability to project their power in the way the United States has? No, I'm not. Um, I, I think that there have only been two times in human history when there's been a unipolar uh, situation or one single global power able to project its power more or less wherever it wanted. One of those periods was between 1815 and 1871, and the other one started in, 80, in 1989, and, and I think I would argue is beginning to come to an end around now. For most of the rest of human history, either uh, different empires or different regions didn't interact with each other at all. You go back to the Roman Empire and the Han Empire, and they never came into contact with each other. Or alternatively, you've had the sort of situation that prevailed in the second half of the 19th century, when you have different power entities jostling against each other, uh, and, and, and the tectonic plates sort of banging up against each other. Um, that was the that's the way you characterize the world between about 1880 and 1914, um, and actually between 1880 and 1945, in fact, I would argue. Um, and uh, uh, and, and um, what we're now seeing is a reversion to more, that more normal state of affairs than uh, a state of affairs where one single power can project itself anywhere. I think the, the lesson of recent years actually is that the US has increasing limitations on its ability to project its power anywhere. I don't think it follows from saying that that is in decline, that therefore other countries have got the power to project themselves anywhere or want to do so. It's just that the world stage is getting more crowded. Yes, but the, the analogy that you use, the, the, the sort of Pax Britannica um, in the middle of the 19th century, I mean, it ended, in, in, in your argument here, in 1871, but I mean, it ended specifically because the Germans marched to Paris and became, it became obvious that they could project their power and subsequently, of course, built a navy, etc. Yeah. So my feeling that, you know, that they seemed to me that the analogy that, that you'd chosen to use was a rather menacing one and suggested that actually uh, that's what the Chinese are going to be doing. No, well, it's certainly not meant to suggest that that's what the Chinese are going to do, but I just think it's a fact. Well, I don't know whether it's a fact yet, but I suspect it'll be a fact that in 20 to 30 years' time you will look at the world and say there are several different regional strong powers and they've got to deal with each other, come to terms with each other, coordinate with each other uh, on certain issues. Uh, and indeed, you hope that it's coordination rather than confrontation. But that be is becoming the reality of the world. And one of the signs of that, I think, graphically, recently, is the emergence of the G20 
as the main forum for international coordination of the response to the financial crisis. Gone are the days when it's the G7, dominated by America. Uh, no, uh, you have to have China and India and Brazil and Saudi Arabia and others on the stage, because only that way can you get all of the interests together. Let me take you a little bit further east, because you also talk about Japan and what I thought was a particularly interesting part of the book, where you really contrast uh, China and Japan and uh, implicitly say that you know, the Chinese are becoming kind of more like us. And then you refer to this phrase, the impenetrable <coughs> difference. <say> that. <laughs> well, you... Uh, I, I, I said I thought there was an interesting similarity between uh, Chinese philosophy stroke culture yes. and European, modern European philosophy stroke culture in that both are quite secularized, quite, yes. quite driven by rational pragmatism. Mm. Uh, and I think that's an interesting fact not often commented on. Um, I don't think that's the case of the Chinese becoming more like us. If anything, it's the opposite way around. Okay, but I still think the point that, that there was a kind of congruence of, of yeah, aims, put, put, put if like, you like. Put like that, I, I, uh, I think that's... And yet you then yeah. refer to the impenetrable difference of Japan. Well, this is, this is not a con comment on aims, actually. It's a comment on corporate psychology, corporate, how, how does society work? Um, and uh, the, the argument that I was making there was that there's, there's something quite individualistic about modern European life. Uh, it's partly a product of urbanization. It's partly a product of the Enlightenment. Um, there's something quite individualistic uh, about Chinese life. It's a product of uh, millennia of, uh, of a Confucianist tradition. Um, in both cases, there are evidences in recent history of uh, episodes of mass hysteria uh, taking over, but I don't think they are the underlying reality of either culture. I do think uh, you can uh, argue that Japan is quite significantly different from that, and that the corporate psychology of Japan, the, corporate, the, the way society works in Japan, is quite significantly different. And do you think what, what consequences flow from that? I mean, what conclusion do you draw? I don't think I draw any particular conclusion at the level of world international relationships. Um, in fact, that argument came up in the context of a more general argument, saying that urbanization gradually breaks down former communitarian structures, and urbanization, which is sweeping through the world, it is the most tangible manifestation of globalization, by the way. It was last year that more than half the world uh, lived in cities, and the proportion moves up from 50% mm. to around 80% over the next 20 mm. to 30 years. That, that process of urbanization is changing the way human beings think about themselves and about their relationships with each other. And I was really uh, looking f to see whether there are any exceptions to the rule that urbanization has that effect on society. And I think the one obvious exception to that rule, at least on the face of it, is Japan, where, which is a very urbanized country, has been urbanized now for two or three generations, and doesn't seem to have uh, developed the same tendency towards very strong individualism that you see in other societies. Okay. You also talk about um, the Islamic world, though perhaps not uh, as, as, as great a length as you talk about China, but you seem to have a fairly optimistic view there, that in fact there isn't a fundamental challenge in the Islamic world to the way we do things around here, if you like. Uh, I was, where, where does that optimism come from, given that there's plenty of things you could quote uh, which suggests that that's a rather misplaced? Well, I think the first thing to say about the Islamic world is it's much more heterogeneous than, 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 we, than, than we often imply by using the phrase the Islamic world. I mean, if you compare Turkey and Indonesia and Bangladesh and Saudi Arabia, these are obviously very different countries, not to mention Iran, since it's been in the yep. news recently. Uh, and, and there is a danger of generalization about the Islamic world. I mean, I, one of the statistics that I quote, which I think is interesting and arguably speaks to this point about the way urbanization changes behavior, is that if you look at the demographics of Turkey, interestingly Iran, uh, Indonesia and Algeria, they all show the same thing. They're all down to replacement rates. Of, of population growth, I, I essentially population mm. growth will cease once the uh, once they've uh, plateaued at, at a new level. Um, in the same sort of way as most European, well, many European countries have gone negative. Now, I think that's an interesting observation, and it's not true of all Islamic countries, but it is true of those. Um, and I think it is a, supports the proposition about the way urbanisation changes people's behaviour. Mm.
And well, um, coming back then to uh, to this country, where in spite of HSBC's business profile, you still have your headquarters here, though you famously review this decision from time to time. Every three years. Every three years. I mean, for the time being, we're on probation here, uh, <laughs> boys and girls. They may decide to leave us. Um, but you describe London as the purest example of a world city. What do you mean by that? I think as of now, it's, it's the most international city. It's a, I, I think London's a fabulous place. It's a great crossroads of the world. There are more different linguistic groups uh, with critical mass in London than there are in any other city in the world currently. Um, uh, and I think there are all sorts of measures of internationalism, but that, that fact kind of does it for you. And there is something unique, therefore, about the place of London in the modern world. I think we got there by, by happenstance. It isn't, a matter, it isn't as if the British government at any, said, at any point in time said, as a matter of policy, we're going to create the most international city in the world. It's come to be uh, by serendipity. Mm. So when you look at this, you know, where you should be, what are the, what are the negatives? Because that all sounds terrific. I, I, I mean, there are potential negatives. Any big city has got plenty of challenges, and London famously has an infrastructure uh, challenge inter alia. Um, the, the, the road that I drive along to the office every morning has been dug up on the same place three times this year. Um, <laughs> so there's some questions to ask about how all this gets organised. Uh, I'm not exaggerating. Um, uh, so those, those are what, that's clearly one set of issues about London. Um, the, the, do, do we have the right kind of governance of a complex city? We can always debate that. Um, but actually, I think my, the, the, this is largely a strong benefit. And I think to be able to walk around Hyde Park, as I do from time to time, and see and, and just listen to 20 different languages as you go by, I think it's an extraordinary, um, uh, sort of stimulating, exciting place to be. And you say also, and this might surprise some people, that you think that Britain is far less racist and class-ridden than it used to be. And this is a book that comes out a month after the BNP has won two seats in the European Parliament and seems to be prospering in councils around the country. Where, where does that observation Well, I, firstly, to be very clear, I did not say, uh, see, did, certainly did not say, and therefore it is not racist or not class-ridden, um, and or sexist, which is the other thing I also think it's become less than it used to mm. be. Uh, but this is just an observation which I think is true. If you think back over, let's say, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, you're my parents' generation, um, I suspect that we have forgotten just how different we are now. Um, but that we've forgotten how it was simply considered normal and acceptable in, in polite society to make the sorts of jokes that would simply make you wince now. Um, this is a society where uh, opinion polls show that sort of 70 to 80 percent of people think of themselves as middle class. Um, this is a society where uh, uh, there is much more interaction of, uh, of, of all sorts of different kinds of people from different community backgrounds. To repeat, this is not saying it's perfect. And then in, and then in terms of gender, it's plainly the case that compared with 30 years ago or 50 years ago, we've advanced. Again, I suspect many people would say we've got some way to go. That may be true. But the notion that we have significantly changed in the last generation or two, I think there's, a, there's quite a lot of evidence for that. I'm tempted to ask you to give an example of a joke that we used to find funny, but which would now make us uh, <laughs> wince. That, that could be a, a rapid end to your promising career. But, um, <laughs> but, but, you do, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I do know what you mean, yes. We can share a few later, perhaps. But, uh, uh, but on, on, on sexism, one part of the uh, country that, uh, one institution that still seems to have a problem with this is Church of England. Um, where we even have still a Bishop of London who will not... Well, it's done better than other churches, I can think of. Yes, but, but where, do you, where are you positioned on that? On? On ordination of women, ordinate women bishops in the Church of Lincoln? Well, are you a the, Bishop of London man or an Archbishop of Canterbury uh, man? I would be... I don't know whether that's a fair characterisation of those two individuals, so I would certainly be in favour of women bishops, absolutely. To me, to me it's just a, 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 a no-brainer. Mm. And, and if, if it's allowed kind of two cheers for, a, for, for an institution that often seems indecisive and befuddled, the way in which they got into having women priests was actually done with a great deal of care and delicacy and sensitivity, such that it's now all but non, not an issue. Mm. Um, and it might have been different. Uh, and there were dire predictions at the time of huge splits and all the rest of it. It doesn't seem to have occurred.
Uh, I should say that um, in a few minutes I'm going to throw this open to the uh, uh, audience, so you should be reflecting on what you'd like to ask. But I'm, if I'm going to just pursue for another 10 minutes or so my own uh, lines of inquiry here. Um, one of the things that you, you say quite a lot in the book is that you are against compartmentalization. Um, but w what do you mean by that? Uh, that's a ref uh, uh, what I mean by that is, I think, and this is looking at this all from the perspective of an, of an individual. I mean, and clearly looking at, for, in my case, from the perspective of an individual who works in the financial markets, but actually I think this is a general proposition for anybody who works in almost anything, including even education. Um, do you run your life, your work life, by the same objectives, principles, rules of life, if you will, that you run the rest of your life by? I think holistic development of the personality, holistic development of the person, tells you you ought really to have an integrated view of the way you run your life and compartmentalization of your, particularly of your work life, which is where it's most likely to occur, uh, versus your social life, your private life, your other realms of life in which you, which you have your being, um, is actually, and I would use the word, spiritually dangerous, and certainly I think it, it leads to all kinds of um, psychological, social, and other problems, and in the specific context of work, enables people to do all kinds of things that they wouldn't dream of thinking appropriate in other realms of life. So, can you give us an example then of how your faith and morality, which you talk about here, influences the decisions that you make in business? Because that's the underlying argument that you advance. But I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure I could see any examples in the book of where you think you've made a decision that you made in a different way or came to a different outcome because of trying to integrate that? Well, let, let me make one comment first, which I think is an important one. I come at this with a specific faith commitment, a specific Christian prism, if you will. Um, but, but I happen to work in a bank that employs 330,000 people in 86 different countries, and they come from virtually every kind of community background that you can imagine, and they will have all kinds of faith commitment or none. There will be agnostics and atheists and humanists and Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and Christians and Jews and, uh, and, and no doubt other things that, that I haven't listed there. Um, and I think it's extremely important in the context of uh, that kind of environment, uh, which is a crossroads of the world, rather as London is a crossroads of the world, uh, that you recognize that this is a multicultural universe. Um, and in that context, I think the good news is that if you think it's important that the business is approached with a degree of professional integrity and morality, and then when, when what you find, uh, this would be my personal testimony, what you find is that when you talk about that around the world of HSBC as I do, uh, the vast, vast majority of people agree with you. And what's more, they agree with the content of that. They uh, if you ask people what does it mean to say I am going to do this business in a professional way with integrity, they will have the same answers, essentially. So there's a great commonality, there's a great human commonality about what it takes to do business with trust, which is especially important in banking, obviously, but it's not unique to banking. Um, uh, what, is it, what does it mean to treat customers fairly? Uh, the great deal of commonality about that. What does it mean to have a long-term relationship versus um, the short-term, the, the, the contract and the next item of profit, there's a great deal of commonality and, and, a, and, a, and a vast majority of people who want to be able to look at themselves in the mirror and say, I'm doing a professional job with integrity. That does not mean that we get it right all the time, needless to say. Uh, one of the things that I think is true about human nature and that I think is underscored by a Christian view of things but shared by others too, I don't doubt, is the understanding that we all are, are all imperfect, the institutions that you work for are imperfect, um, there are ambiguities, and therefore this is about shades of grey. Nevertheless, if you ask what the aspiration should be, there's a great deal of commonality about uh, how that's defined. So is it helpful to think about this in faith terms at all if you say there is commonality of, in terms of morality and integrity of doing business between people with all faiths and none? Well, I, uh, from my point of view, writing a book which is a personal reflection, I can't do other than, so this is, the, this is my prism through which I see mm. the world. So that's just kind of me writing it. Um, but I wouldn't be entirely surprised to find somebody else writing a similar book from a different perspective, including a humanist one, and reaching essentially similar conclusions about how you should behave uh, in, 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 in the context of all normal business issues. Mm. Now, some people would say that the, that the crisis through which we are 
still uh, living, and I'm sure you agree that we are still living through it, still living through it um, is one which has posed quite a serious challenge to the way banks have done business, and that um, you know, in some cases, integrity is not the first word that kind that of would, jumps, that come to, to, people's jumps minds. to mind, really, in terms of the way people have run themselves. Um, and yet you say, uh, you, you say that there are a number of big questions um, which we have to ask ourselves, but you know, your, your answers are reasonably optimistic, I guess. And one is, is open market capitalism unstable? But then you implicitly go on to say, well, there's no alternative to it in terms of, you know, your, you say there are four imperatives to the new world order, and the first is very Thatcherite observation, there is no alternative. Um, well, it's Tina. not Thatcherite in its content. <laughs> no, but nonetheless, the second one is also called No Turning Back, which was even more <laughs> Thatcherite. <laughs> Actually, that, that was the name of a particular group of proto-Thatcherite uh, Tory MPs. So you've nailed your colours firmly to the Tory mask, which is no, good no, positioning I, no, 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 ahead no, no, of the no, election. Not so. I, not so. Oh, I know, I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. But is it, I mean, is it the case, you know, how do you answer this question, is an open market capitalism unstable? Because it looks, doesn't look pretty stable, I, very look, stable look, to most people here no, at the moment. No, I clip to, or, or, or to anybody within the system, within the financial markets or, or not, uh, an unmanaged, unsupervised open market capitalism, capitalism plainly is unstable. What's more always has been. So the argument is not about whether you can have an unsupervised, unregulated capitalism and rely on, quotes, market efficiency from the textbooks to sort all of the problems out. That's nonsense, even if it has been said in some economics textbooks from time to time. No, I think the argument is about whether you have markets as the main engine of economic development properly supervised, and all parts of that phrase are important, or whether you go to some completely different sort of alternative. Um, and then I, I guess Faced with that proposition, I do take what you might describe as the Churchillian defense. Uh, the Churchill, Churchill's famous comments on democracy, it's the worst form of government except for all of the others that have been tried from time to time, is essentially where I would come out with open markets properly regulated. It's the worst form except for the others that have been tried from time to time. And if there's one thing it seems to me that we've learned from the 20th century is you sort of know what the other things look like. So in spite of what you said about integrity of doing business and everybody in HSBC would share this, essentially you're also saying you can't be trusted. I'm saying, whoops, gosh. <laughs> I, I'm saying that I think that, uh, I mean the open markets are not just about banks by the way, it's about the, the way the whole economy works. Um, and I'm saying I don't think there is an, a, 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 a serious alternative to that for achieving economic and social development. I mean, others have been tried, to be clear. We know what it's like. Uh, China had the experience of, uh, of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. We've, we've seen what happened in Soviet Union um, before and after the war. Um, you, you've seen alternatives tried out. Um, and I don't think there is a realistic alternative. Now, exactly how the supervision works and exactly where the boundaries between state activity and private sector activity fall, that will shift from time to time. And it is very clear that this crisis has caused entirely rightly a fundamental stock taking about where we were heading. And I don't believe that we'll emerge from this crisis by going, going back to the status quo ante, and in that sense, there's no turning back. Uh, there's no turning back to what the world felt like in the first few years of this decade. So you have changed it's your... It's not a Thatcherite proposition. <laughs> you have changed your mind. I mean, you, and you jumped to another Tory in Churchill, so that's fine. You're still in the Tory cabinet. <laughs> um, but uh, you, you, you have changed your mind, then, on the nature of regulation that you need to keep you honest. Now, I'm not sure that I've changed my mind, no, because I don't I think I ever thought that you could do without regulation of many sectors of activity, to repeat. This is not just about banks, but specifically the financial system very definitely requires regulation. It is too important to the whole economy. It is intrinsic to the lifeblood of an economy. Um, there is a sense in which uh, the economy simply can't let the financial system fail. It is, that is too disastrous in its consequences. And therefore, there's a public interest in uh, effective and quite intrusive regulation. Um, 
very clearly this crisis has taught people a lot of lessons and the nature of regulation will change as a result of this crisis. I mean, it gets quite technical and it's important to get technical about the detail, otherwise you don't get it right and you don't learn the right lessons from it. But just to name one rather high level point, if there's one thing primarily that was wrong with the regulation of the banking system, not only in this country but globally in fact, in the years running up to 2007, it was that people didn't pay enough attention to liquidity. Um, liquidity matters. It is liquidity that kills banks more, far more quickly than a shortage of capital does. And uh, no attention was being paid to liquidity. That's something uh, which is both a, an indictment of bank managements but it, and it's also an indictment of the regulators. And to be fair to the FSA, the FSA has publicly acknowledged that. that you know, be, be fair to them. I think, they, I think they have done a very good and honest job of reviewing where they went wrong far more honestly and far more openly than other regulators in other countries. And that's the thing that they focus on most of all. But it's odd in a way that the regulators should need to tell you that you need liquidity. I mean, that's kind of page one of banking. I quite agree. I quite agree. But a lot of what regulation is about is telling, telling banks uh, uh, that the emperor's got no clothes or to call the spade the spade, um, to continuously oversee uh, after all, you could say the same thing about boards. Boards shouldn't have to tell managements to, wor to worry about liquidity. But boards are the locus of central accountability of, as it were, internal governance, mm -hmm. while the supervisors are the locus of responsibility for, as it were, external governance. And because of the intrinsic importance of banks to the system, that kind of belt and braces approach, where you've got boards who should be doing their job and supervisors who should be doing their job, is actually entirely warranted. I'm going to throw it open. In, uh, with one, I'm going to have one more question and then I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, you don't say uh, really much of anything about uh, pay. You do talk about the worries about the marginalised who don't benefit from the growth generated by globalisation and open markets. But you don't really say a lot about rewards. What, why do you think bankers are paid so much? I think, uh, first of all, it's only a small, now, small number of bankers, if you take it as a percentage of the total that have paid the, the headline grabbing amounts. And I think there is clear evidence that in recent years, bank compensation has been driven up by market distortions. Um, market distortion of allowing too much gearing, too much complex product, and compensation structures that allow people to walk away with the profits on day one, even if there was still a tail risk left on the institution's balance sheet for the next several years. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you could certainly say that not only have been paid, people been paid a lot, but they've been paid more than they should have been because of those kinds of market distortions. Let me turn it over to uh, 